A woman has come forward publicly accusing Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh of assaulting her at a party more than 30 years. That's when they were both in high school, more than 30 years ago. According to the Washington Post, the woman's name is Christine Blasey Ford. She's a professor at Palo Alto University. Worth remembering, Alex, Brett Kavanaugh has vehemently denied her allegations. And in fact, on Friday, he issued a statement and he said, I categorically and unequivocally deny this allegation. I did not do this back in high school or at any time. But in the Washington Post's uh, article, she does reveal more details. She said at one point that she thought he might inadvertently kill her and he was trying to attack me and remove my clothing. Uh, she tells the Washington Post she only shared the details of this uh, years later with a therapist, with her husband, and that was back in 2012. And according to the article, the husband recalls his wife using Kavanaugh's name, but the therapist's notes, which were reviewed by the Post, don't. Uh, at first, the woman declined to come publicly forward, you'll remember, uh, last week. Instead, she sent that letter to Dianne Feinstein on July 30th. And the letter had a lot of these details, Alex. Uh, she's in the letter, uh, according to a source, uh, she said that Kavanaugh physically pushed her in a bedroom and along with another male locked the door from the inside, put on loud music. Uh, she alleges in that letter that the two teens were drunk. Uh, it's worth noting the second teen has come forward and has denied the allegations uh, to the Weekly Standard. But she says that at one point Kavanaugh was on top of her uh, and in that moment he had her hand, his hand over her mouth and in that moment, Alex, she said she feared she was in danger. Yeah, Ariane, some extraordinarily disturbing details uh, in this new piece from the Washington Post. In, in addition to what you just mentioned, I want to read part of it. She writes, while his friend watched, Kavanaugh pinned her to a bed on her back and groped her over her clothes, grinding his body against hers and clumsily attempting to pull off her one-piece bathing suit and the clothing she wore over it. When she tried to scream, she said he put his hand over her her mouth. So we are not going to be the only ones reading this. Of course, uh, that Senate Judiciary Committee is also going to be reading these extremely disturbing allegations. How is that going to impact uh, this confirmation? Well, it's hard to say, right? At the end of last week, the Republicans were vowing that these hearings would go forward. And back then, they were very puzzled because they said that Dianne Feinstein, who is the top Democrat on the committee, had received these allegations all the way back in July. And Feinstein hadn't brought them forward. And they only, uh, she only referred the allegations to the FBI after the hearings were over. But Kavanaugh came... Or, Feinstein came back at the time and said, look, she was under, uh, she is in a tough spot because at that time, this woman did not want her name used publicly. Uh, but that's changed today. She's come forward to the Washington Post uh, using her name and she's now on the record. I want to bring in our uh, uh, senior media correspondent, Brian Stelter, host of Reliable Sources. Uh, Brian, she remained silent as this blew up in the media. Um, she, that was her main goal, was to remain anonymous, we understand. Why do you think she came forward? I think we see through this post interview this woman struggle with what to do, with, with wanting to keep her privacy and not see her name and her family be smeared uh, as may uh, happen, unfortunately, in the coming hours. On the other hand, you, you hear her struggling with the feeling that somehow she needs to speak out and has a duty to speak out to tell the public about this allegation. So you can see that in the in the interview. I think we should go through the timeline, Less. give people a sense of how this happened. Uh, she says that in July, she actually first called the Washington Post through one of those tip lines. An anonymous available, tip line. An anonymous tip line wanting to let the, the Post know about this allegation. And interestingly, Alex, that was before Kavanaugh was nominated. It was when Kavanaugh was on, was the, on short the short list. list. Uh, expected to be nominated, but but not officially nominated. So, so she felt uh, at the time she wanted to alert the Washington Post. Uh, then she also alerted her local congresswoman. And then at the end of July, uh, she wrote the letter to Feinstein's office, which, which we've all heard about. Uh, however, throughout the month of August, she wrestled with whether to go on the record, whether to stay anonymous uh, or whether to speak out and put her name onto it. And apparently, according to the Post, uh, she decided to stay anonymous. She decided she did not want to come forward, uh, qu quoting here, 
calculating that doing so would upend her life and probably would not affect Kavanaugh's confirmation. She said to the Post, why suffer through the annihilation if it's not going to matter? And of course, what happened in late August and early September is that her story was starting to leak out anyway. The existence of this Feinstein letter became, started to become better known. The website The Intercept wrote about it. Others wrote about it. So all of a sudden, there was this allegation, but not a, not a face, not a name, just an anonymous allegation. Uh, and apparently, she has now changed her calculation. She feels she has to speak out publicly. Uh, and frankly, partly that's because reporters were starting to call her and email her and show up at her door. In the, in the past few days, reporters from a number of news outlets have known her name, known her identity, and tried to reach out to her. Uh, and according to the Post interview here, which lays it out in great detail, uh, she felt it was necessary to go on the record. Yeah, and so she got married in 2002. At the time, she didn't say anything to her parents. She didn't report this to the authorities. She kept this bottled up inside. And she says in this post piece, I think it derailed me substantially for four or five years. I was very ill-equipped to forge those kinds of relationships. She got married in 2002, and it was only 10 years later when she was in couples therapy with her husband that she mentioned Kavanaugh's name. Yeah, in 2012, and I think that is going to end up being a, a very important pivot point in this story. However this unfolds in the next few hours and days, uh, we have heard time and time again when there are allegations of sexual misconduct, not just among judges, but among executives and among artists, uh, sometimes people will say, the woman just wants attention, or she's making it up. And it's vital that in this case, there is a document from 2012 that shows that she was in therapy and that she told a story about something like this. Now, as you mentioned earlier, the document does not, from the therapist, the document does not say Kavanaugh's name, but her husband is saying that Kavanaugh's name came up out loud at the 2012 right. therapy session. So I think that's going to be an important detail going forward that she didn't just start talking about this in July. And we should note that the allegations are that there were four boys in that house. Yeah, at that Kavanaugh, party. Kavanaugh, Judge, yeah. were the two allegedly in that room, but there were two others downstairs at that party. The Washington Post did reach out to them um, and did not get a response. And have not heard back. So uh, you immediately wonder about what they will say. Uh, these two men who have been accused here have denied it. The other two men who were at the party, they have not responded in any way, shape, or form. I think we should also note, uh, she is describing here for it in this Washington Post interview, uh, she admits she doesn't remember everything. She does not know every detail. She doesn't know exactly where it happened. She doesn't know exactly when, when it happened. So his allegations although they are detailed in some ways, and, and you, you hear her describing what she says was trauma as a result, uh, that's going to be one of the holes that's going to get poked here, and sometimes that is what happens in these cases. But to the argument that we sometimes hear in this Me Too age that she just wants attention, uh, I think that is, that is contradicted by the fact that she struggled to decide whether to come forward. And only now, in early September, did she decide to go on the record. When reporters started knocking, started knocking on her, on her door, door, making it harder for her to stay anonymous. But also that same struggle that we've heard so often from women in this Me Too age. She went home. Um, she doesn't know how she got home. And she says, well, you know, nothing really happened to me. Right, um, you downplayed in your own mind. Right. You tell yourself, this wasn't that big a deal. I wasn't actually raped. That's, that's what she's saying in this interview, that only she told later. herself, told herself that, that this was not that serious and only later realized how serious it was. And unfortunately, even though this happened decades ago, according to Ford, this is the kind of thing you still hear young women struggling with. Let's remember, she said she was 15 at the time. Uh, and it is, I think, one other detail worth noting. She did hire a Washington lawyer, Deborah Katz. Uh, she took a polygraph test, not uh, you know an official government approved one, but a polygraph test uh, administrated by a former FBI agent. So that polygraph result, which tested positive, saying that she did tell the truth, I think will also become one of these key pivot points. Which, which corroborated her story. So there's so many different sides to this. Obviously the horrible things that allegedly happened to her, but then also uh, what, how the White House is going to respond and what's going to happen uh, in these confirmation hearings. And you can't help but think about Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas. And we also know that Anita Hill has responded to this before this yeah. piece came out, saying that there should be some sort of government investigation into these allegations. Right, from the FBI or somewhere else or by the Judiciary Committee. I have to be honest, Alex, when I first read this story a few minutes ago, I, I cringed thinking about what President Trump will say about this. If history is any guide, uh, he will stand with Kavanaugh and he could very well demean the woman involved. That has been his history. Uh, he has not been a proponent of the Me Too movement. Instead, he has been a detractor. Uh, and of course, his own history, uh, where women have accused him of sexual assault, uh, comes to mind right away. But putting Trump to the side, if that's possible for a second, uh, the more interesting folks to watch will be the senators, the key senators in this case, uh, who may have already known some of these details, but I don't think knew all of it that's now been published by the Washington Post.